what heterogeneous number of times. So there'd be a sequence T2, G4, followed by T2, G4, T2, G4, T2, G4. And then, of course, the other strand would have the complementary basis. So the other strand would be a series of Cs and As. The, uh, at the very end of the chromosome, the strand that's rich in Gs protrudes off the end without the Cs and A's to pair with it as a short, single-stranded overhang, and I'll show you a picture of that later. Human telomeres have a very similar hexanucleotide repeat, differing in only one of the six positions. And this provides us with some confidence that uh, there must be similarities with the way that chromosome ends are handled in very diverse organisms. So maybe we don't, if we're interested in human chromosome ends, maybe we don't have to study only human chromosome termini. Maybe we can understand, maybe we can study simpler model systems that have uh, a similar telomeric DNA repeated sequence and therefore perhaps handle the questions of how do you cap off a chromosome end and how do you replicate it in a similar manner. One of the organisms we look at, Oxytrica, and also its closely re uh, related cousin, Euplodes ediculatus, which you saw uh, in the hall at, here at the Institute on that television monitor, the one that was eating the algae, those organisms have uh, an octonucleotide repeat. Again, T's and G's, uh, in this case repeated a specific number of times rather than a large and, and heterogeneous number of times at least at the ends of the macronuclear chromosome. So this is the multiple uh, small chromosomes present in the macronucleus of, of this organism. Uh, and if you go to other organisms such as baker's yeast, you find that occasionally there's, uh, the repeat isn't quite so uniform that uh, instead of being a very accurate repeated sequence, in baker's yeast sometimes you find T, G, sometimes you find T followed by two or three Gs, and such blocks of sequence are repeated a large number of times. So far, it's only in the fruit, fr fruit fly, Drosophila, that, a, uh, fail that it looks like chromosome ends are maintained without there being a simple repeated sequence. So we have uh, a phenomenon here that's extremely widespread in biology for organisms that have linear chromosomes, which would be the eukaryotic organisms. Bacteria don't have to worry about telomeres. They have circular chromosomes. If you have a circle, that's a, not, a nice way of not having to worry about ends, right? But those organisms that have linear chromosomes with ends typically have this sort of repeated sequence at the end. So given this similarity, we chose an organism to look at. Uh, this is Oxytrica, that has a large number of chromosomes and therefore a large number of ends. There are 46 chromosomes in a human cell, in a diploid cell. There are about 46 million chromosomes in each oxytrica cell. So we have a million-fold abundance of telomeres and of all of the goodies that interact with telomeres. And if you're a biochemist and you want to uh, under, you want to purify and understand the function of a molecule, why not pick an organism that exaggerates a particular phenomenon so that you have a lot more material to work with? The uh, advantage of choosing this organism becomes very apparent when uh, you simply take, isolate the large nuclei from these cells and extract the protein present in those nuclei. You find in this lane, this again is a gel electrophoresis technique used to separate, in this case, protein molecules rather than RNA molecules uh, according to their molecular weight. So the small ones are near the bottom and the large ones near the top. These numbers refer to uh, thousands of Daltons or thousands of mass units. So this would be 18,000. Uh, as you can see, biochemists work with very large molecules compared to the sort that you encounter in a uh, normal chemistry course. So we have uh, present in these nuclei the histone proteins which wrap up the middle parts of the chromosomes and form what are called nucleosomes 
in oxytrica just as they would in human. And then we see two prominent proteins at about uh, 43 and 56,000 molecular weight, and those turn out to form this chromosome cap. In a single step purification, uh, taking advantage of their tight association with the chromosome ends, we can purify, you can see essentially to completeness, these telomere proteins, and then ask the question, uh, why do there have to be two of them, and exactly what do they do to help maintain the end of the chromosome? The story that we worked out was that it's the very end of the chromosome, the place where the double-stranded repeated sequence ends and the G-rich strand protrudes for 16 nucleotides beyond the double-stranded region of the chromosome. This single-stranded overhang is the place that the alpha and beta subunits of the, we call the big one alpha and the sm slightly smaller one beta, these two subunits of the telomere protein recognize this sequence and form a very tight complex on the, both ends of each of these multiple chromosomes. So this provides a way of preventing degradation and other unwanted associations of chromosome ends by uh, sealing off the DNA with this very tightly bound protein complex. We've gone a step further and we've taken apart each of those protein chains and ask the question, well, can, can we define a different activity for different parts of each of these polypeptides? Remember, a protein is just a string of amino acids that are chemically bonded to each other. And so uh, using genetic engineering, we can uh, use the bacterium E. coli to grow either the normal type of oxytrica telomere binding protein, or we can make variant proteins which are missing a portion of the polypeptide <coughs> chain. When we did this analysis on the alpha chain, we found that uh, a portion of the protein near the left-hand end was sufficient for binding to the DNA, but it bound much more weakly than the entire complex. The reason it bound so weakly uh, had to do with the fact that beta was not also present in the complex. So the left-hand part of alpha by itself can bind to chromosome ends, but then if you add beta, nothing happens. The beta just ignores it and does not enter into the complex. The right-hand portion of the alpha chain is needed in order to recruit beta into this complex. And then the portion of beta that is involved in helping make the chromosome cap is just its left-hand portion, amino acids in between position 5 and 232. The right-hand portion of beta is not directly involved in capping off the chromosome, but it's an arm that reaches out and appears to interact, make one chromosome end interact with the DNA from other chromosome ends. A fascinating story by itself, which I'm not going to have time to explore in much detail during this hour. A colleague of mine, uh, Steve Schultz, working completely independently from our lab, uh, he's an X-ray crystallographer, and he decided to take on the huge challenge of trying to get one of these X-ray crystallographic, let's see where every atom is located, sort of views of the complex between alpha, beta, and the DNA that caps off the chromosome end. And before I show you that picture, I want to show you the picture that a graduate student in the laboratory, Guo Wei Fang, was able to derive from biochemical experiments without using crystallography. And it was based on the domain analysis that I just showed you. Uh, in his PhD thesis, he suggested that both the alpha and the 